Views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the News Hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Good afternoon. My name is Michael McAuliffe, and with me is my co-host, Perry Haichu, and welcome to the We Can 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Uh, we have a lot to talk about this week, uh, as we do every week. Ma ma cannabis and cannabis reform uh, are always in the news these days. It, it, it is, is something that uh, that the people are aware of. They realize tax revenues and benefits to so society, and uh, so we are never short of stories. And, and, and we want to bring charged year, especially. And, and a, a politically charged year. Well, we live in a politically charged country. Yes, sir. We so, do. So you know that's that's just the way it is. Um, you know, probably the biggest news this week in the past week uh, has been the long anticipated DEA ruling about uh, cannabis in Schedule 1 and, and they were giving every indication in the early part of this year that they would be uh, doing some sort of rescheduling uh, down to Schedule 2. Previously, uh, several years past, they had talked about Schedule 3 for cannabinoid-based products. Um, and so there was every reason to believe that they were going to do something. And ultimately, though, last Thursday, they came out and they said, no, we th still think marijuana is dangerous and we still think it has no medicinal value. And therefore, we're going to leave it in right up there uh, at Schedule 1. And everybody was surprised about that. The DEA that, I think. administrator said that the science doesn't support rescheduling right now and that their their uh, decision was based on the science that they had available to them, which of course is complete nonsense, but it's just something that they're able to kind of hide behind. But you know, I guess they did kind of crack the door open for, for something though. There wasn't a complete shutdown. They kind of... Uh, I guess mm, yes or no, and, and and we'll we'll get into that. But as far as no science, uh, it's because the DEA uh, has kept their boot on on the throat of researchers across this country for decades and not given them the opportunity to prove this science. And science has been done around the world, University of Madrid, uh, University of Tel Aviv, uh, uh, as well as there. there's plenty of work that has been done in this country that is just not up to the level of formal scientific studies. I mean, though, if you want to look at um, uh, not that it's a scientific forum in any way, but you can go you can go on a YouTube and you can see people's actual stories, things that they have done, things that they have experienced, their changes in health. The anecdotal evidence is huge in this area. Now, government agencies are not set up to handle with anecdotal evidence, uh, but that being said, you'd be surprised how quickly you can have a knock at, at your door from police officers based on anecdotal evidence of somebody down the street saying what you're doing in your yeah, house. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. I'm like, you know, they, they kind of use this uh, to their advantage whenever they feel it convenient and do not allow the average civilians to... Uh to exercise that same amount of flexibility mm -hmm. in our interpretation of what we believe is good for us. Uh, you know, I, I, seeing is believing, you know, when you see a child that's having a seizure and they have the medicine given to them and they stop the seizure and someone will actually have the balls to set up and say, oh, well, you know, you're faking it. And it's just like, well, okay, you know, like, what do you say to someone like that? You just kind of have to move on when and go to the next person. When you're two person. years old, you're too young to even understand what the concept of faking it is. Yeah, but you, you see, know, that's the kind of nonsense old. that we're dealing with, though, is people will just shove that away and cling to their dogma or whatever they're clinging mm -hmm. to. I don't understand what it is, but like you said, how many people were outraged about this, uh, or not outraged, but just a little surprised well, they're surprised. A number of, of them are outraged, but, you know, the problem is with Americans, we are outraged. We're so outraged that we pick up our remote and we change the channel. And yeah. Then we've got, you know, well, even Fox friends News, on Well, even Fox like News that. is kind of on the bandwagon. Shep Shepard Smith, yeah. Well, Shepard Smith, like, he's a pretty conservative guy. I wouldn't really put mm -hmm. him in our corner, so mm -hmm. to say. And even he was just kind of very sarcastically jabbing 
at the at the DEA like he really believes that it affects their credibility as an organization and as a governmental agency to continue to ignore not the will of the people but the real deal science and the tax revenue and you know he points to all these various talking points that we point to on a regular basis mm -hmm. it was kind of funny for me to see what most people in the cannabis industry would perceive as not the enemy but like I said not a friendly not a friendly news organization to have one of their main reporters so openly jump on our uh, jump on our bandwagon over that well, and it's they, a good thing it's a good thing what, what he's saying is is fair and balanced though you know and well, in that's this case the, it truly is yeah uh, you know that that people uh, are just surprised about this that how can the government keep uh, cannabis up there with uh, uh, heroin and LSD and ecstasy and all see, these things. And here's a, this other contributor that wa he was interviewing made a point to where that uh, she says, it's weird to you that it's such a big part of the economy. You can order weed, I'm told, as quickly as you can get a pizza in the big cities, yet it's not taxed and it's not part of our economic system. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why that product should be eliminated. Absolutely. And it's just like purely from a from an economic Republican standpoint, they're trying to look at this in a way. So that's very... Uh, I don't not want to say only, progressive not only of them, Republican, but, but um, uh, libertarian as well. That sure. uh, both from a market perspective and from the uh, personal responsibility perspective, that that uh, you should have small government and people uh, should be able to exercise dominion over their own private lives. Absolutely. And what's more, what's more private and personal than managing one's own pain? Sure. And you know, actually, we're we're going to go off on, on, on that in, in just a little bit as well because there's a there are hearings coming up in this state. But one of the things that, that I found interesting is we're talking about um, the DEA uh, refusing to rescheduling uh, and I get this from uh, Paul Armentano uh, writing on Alternet and Paul of course was uh, a big gun at uh, normal for a long time um, and he wrote that the DEA's intent is articulated in the August 11th edition of the US Federal Register and you know that's where they're they're saying that they're not going to uh, they're not going to change this but if you look at closer inspection and the DEA makes it clear that its new policy is motivated by more than simply a willingness to increase the nation's federal supply of legal pot rather because because they said they're going to make several sites available uh, for cultivation of cannabis for studies but but they didn't list what the criteria yeah so mm -hmm. you know could UNLV potentially apply like since it's a University of Mississippi that's now growing it or is it going to have to be these other facilities you know they haven't Broken, broken into they that. They made yet, broad so. brushstrokes, but they haven't filled in exactly. any of the details. But maybe part of that is because it looks like the agency's ultimate goal looks to be domestic production of pharmaceutically produced medical cannabis products. And the agency said that the historical system under which NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, relied on is, is one grower in the University of Mississippi to supply marijuana on a contract basis, and they were designated primarily to apply it for federally funded research, not for commercial product development. Thus, under historical, under the historical system, there was no clear legal pathway for commercial enterprises to produce marijuana for product development. Mm -hmm. And and so what what they're looking at doing here is opening the door for large pharmaceutical company research. And if they, the pharmaceutical companies are the ones doing that research, uh, this is a betting town, so you can bet dollars to donuts that the, it will be the pharmaceutical companies that are looking to be in control of the distribution of this. And you can look whether you're talking about Marinol, which is synthetic THC, or uh, here in America, or uh, GW Pharmaceuticals over in Britain with their Sativex, which is a whole plant extract. But um, oh boy. this is something where, once again, the mainstream American, the little guy, the small businessman, the mid-level entrepreneur, are are angling to be shut out mm -hmm. of this huge industry and certainly and I'm not saying that I don't want the pharmaceutical companies to investigate because they have the the resources to develop these these therapies through these plants and kind of isolate these these various compounds with the, the kind of unlock the secrets inside of this plant that can you know that cl as closet growers will never be able to uh, 
to do just because of the facilities they have and the amount of education that some of their scientists have received and things like that. So I applaud their willingness to want to investigate, but I do fear their overburdensome uh, regulation that comes with developing these FDA drugs and getting it through to approval and things like that. And like you said, it's just kind of scary to think that a lot of industry that didn't really have a lot to do with the industry could end up controlling it in the lot in the not too distant future and it's even more than that like i've heard that in conjunction with that that there there is talk from the dea of uh, like the big alcohol industry and possibly even some pharmaceutical industries lobbying congress now for a comprehensive drug to driving dui bill mm -hmm. to kind of put the lid on some of this you know and uh because we've been fighting that battle too so we'll see how that develops in the next year or so but I, I, I'm just kind of leery of, uh, of big Fortune 500 companies being too deeply involved in the industry too quickly. And that's well, why I don't really care if it stays Schedule 1 for a while. Or there are those who don't care if it stays Schedule 1 because it keeps a lot of the bigger companies on the fringes. They'll stay the hell mm -hmm. away from it as mm -hmm. long as it's still that federally illegal, which at least gives the industry enough time to prop itself up to where they can become a lobbying entity of their own mm -hmm. before they'll either be able to have the authority to wield their own power in Congress or at least be bought out for what they're rightfully worth. And in truth, moving it down to Schedule 2 doesn't do uh, anybody uh, in this industry a big favor. No. Uh, you know, no. It, it is almost as restrictive as, as Schedule 1. And, you know, I do not have um, a, a big investment portfolio, uh, including a lot of pharmaceutical companies. And so, you know, I, ha I have no stake in this. But I, I can't think that their motives are pure and humanitarian uh, because the pharmaceutical industry, while while, and they're the largest uh, lobbying group in Congress, uh, while they have been supporting the DEA and fighting rescheduling of cannabis at the same time that we've got a massive opioid crisis going on in this country, you've got the pharmaceutical companies making stronger and stronger and stronger uh, opioids and now marketing them uh, to doctors to and with government approval to prescribe to children under 11 years old. Absolutely. I mean, it's absolutely insane that you're taking this thing. And, you know, I, I don't believe the government or the pharmaceutical companies or anyone should get between a doctor and a patient and their pain relief. That said, uh, there is a legitimate opioid crisis in this country, and one that we know and people in this industry know could be significantly ameliorated, reduced by by having legal medical cannabis for people around the country. And so it's just, it, it's a crazy situation, but they're, they're, this is you know, not something new that has sprung up. As Arantano writes, you know, historically, the, the interest in commercial drug development has largely been limited to the creation of synthetic agonists uh, that mimic natural components of the plant, such as Marinol, which I mentioned earlier, plus a couple of others that I am not familiar with called Cizamet and Syndros. Uh, which is it's a Never synthetic it. no it's a synthetic uh, version of the anti-convulsive uh, properties of uh, CBD and US pharmaceutical firms can for the first time now contemplate becoming involved with developing and or patenting medicines derived from the actual plant itself either in the form standardized uh, of, of strains or in, in extracts they made and so uh, Thursday, Thursday's ruling was not the first time that the anti-drug agency has courted Big Pharma. As reported back in 2011, the DEA previously acknowledged its intent to expand the federal government's Schedule 3 listing to include pharmaceutical products complaining plant-derived THC while simultaneously maintaining existing criminal pro prohibition on the plant itself. So Schedule 3, they're talking about Marinol and, and other things like that, but they're still saying the plant is bad. And all along, as, as what they've been saying in the in the media about this is the, the plant is not medicine you can't you, you can't smoke the medicine uh, you know ignoring vaporizing and ignoring edibles but and we'll all isolate this sort of the stuff. same exact things that get you stoned and put it into a laboratory yes but we'll we'll make them we'll make them through chemistry for better living and you know and it's it's an and it's outrageously situation. expensive by the way absolutely Absolutely. The last time that I had heard, and this was several years ago, uh, a one-month supply of Marinol was on the order of fourteen hundred dollars. That sounds about right. Yeah. You know, it's just it, it's absolutely crazy. Now things are are hopefully going to happen. Um, 
you know, the DEA is, is a, a subdivision of the United States Department of Justice, which is itself uh, a subdivision of the executive branch of our government. And our president, Barack Obama, had you know, previously said, well, I'm going to let Congress decide this, and, and this is an issue for Congress. And Congress, of course, has done nothing. And, and they're not going to. And, and, no, and, and they're not going to, certainly not, not in this session. And now you have the DEA, which is under the president's control, coming out with, with this. And I've, I said for years, the first black president was not going to be able to do anything about cannabis reform in his first term. And then I extended that and said, well, then he's got the second term midterms, so he'll be freed up after that. And now here he is in, in his final um, six months or so in, in office, and and he still hasn't done anything. And it, with oh, a stroke of his pen. Saying. He just says, oh, you know, if you want me to change the law, you need to bring me a, bring me a bill and I'll sign it. And it's just like, that's not... You know, that's not going to happen. He knows better. But, uh, you know, just, what, what is he afraid of? You think he's afraid of uh, ruining afraid of his legacy, ruining his legacy? What legacy? Um, <laughs> we won't get into that debate. Yeah, but, but, still, but I do think, you know, it's exceptionally hypocritical of of a leader. And, and whether that is Bill Clinton, George W. Bush or Barack Obama to have done illegal substances and freely admit it uh, when they were younger and yet still support policies that are putting those people in jail today. And you recall last week we were discussing about that Native American kid, 19 oh year old God. with a gram that they at a at a federal Mandatory school. Minimums. And yeah, they were looking at putting him in jail for a year. I heard uh, a pundit on television talking about uh, how this, well, it's going to happen. Either Trump or Hillary gets in. Mm -hmm. It'll be the first time since 1993 that we haven't had a president that has admittedly smoked right. cannabis. Right. That's and that's very and strange. Very publicly, uh, for many years, Donald Trump has has vowed that he has not had so much as a drink, you know, or a cigarette. Yeah, or yeah, like that. I've and, heard and him and say I, that too. I believe him on that. You know, there are some people who go through life that way, and that's fine. Hillary, I just don't know. Uh, you know. No, However, I don't, I don't speaking know. of Hillary, though, uh, just, uh, what she we've got an article from ThinkProgress.org uh, that Hillary Clinton vows to do what Obama hasn't: reschedule marijuana. And so, since we know that the DEA has just uh, uh, prevented uh, this rescheduling, uh, in her, in a statement published by the Cannabis, uh, Maya Harris, a senior policy advisor to the Clinton administration, applauded the DEA's concurrent move to loosen restrictions on growing marijuana for big business, uh, and indicated that Clinton will go even further. And what she said was, and I quote, "We applaud the steps taken today by the Obama administration to move, remove research barriers that have significantly limited the scientific study of marijuana." Mar Marijuana is also already being used for medical purposes in states across the country and has the potential for even further medical use. As, as Hillary has said throughout the campaign, we should make it easier to study marijuana so we can better uh, understand its, its effects. And so as president, Hillary will build on the important steps announced today, I don't think they were so important, by, by rescheduling marijuana from Schedule 1 to a Schedule 2 substance. She wants it in pharmacies. Yay, Hillary. She, wa she wants uh, to put uh, it in pharmacies. Yeah, it, it's exactly... Well, this is leading from what we were just talking about. This helps big business, and and, only, and yeah, Hillary's was, a friend uh, of big business. Well, of course, she was executive counsel for Monsanto for a number of years, who was, of course, deeply involved in our agricultural supply. And there's a lot of bad press going around mm -hmm. uh, about them. You know, they're genetically modified the GMOs, food, and, yeah. And uh, you know, there are I don't want to call them substantiated reports, but there are rumors flying around that they have uh, paid universities to fire scientists who do research that come up with negative finding or yeah you know, absolutely uh, and, and you look at our, our, our friend sue sisley from university of arizona how hard it was for her to uh to ultimately find a home to do these uh, well, studies and she's trying to help veterans well sure of course it doesn't matter you're still a bad guy because you're a doper or mm -hmm. even if she doesn't even smoke weed she's and, researching it and she's right. you know a bad person because of it or you know so when clinton says oh you know i'm going to reschedule marijuana and i'm going to help you guys it's just like man like, I, I don't believe her or trump to tell you the truth because i've heard trump go back and forth so many times on it and he's like oh you know i'm for medical but i'm not for recreational and then he came out as oh you know it's a state's rights thing i'm kind of for recreational mm -hmm. and i'll let you know uh, i'll let uh 
Colorado and Washington do their thing, but you know the Justice Department and the Constitution's the law of the land and the Attorney General and this, and it's just like every time I turn around, it's a different story. So yeah. you know the only one who's really consistent on it is is Johnson, who's Gary a former, Johnson, former CEO of a medical marijuana company out of New Mexico. I have no I have no doubt that he's uh, on the team. But, I, you know, I've met him. He's gonna... a nice guy. I haven't smoked with him, but I've seen photographs of him smoking. Uh, you know, oh, he just he, said, you know, he admitted it that he smokes yeah. recreationally up until this point. He said, oh, I got to quit smoking for the campaign. Yep. <laughs> it's just like. And um, I don't know yeah. that he had to, you know, that, right. was, that was a political choice. Well, I'll tell you what, it's time for our first break and we're going to be back in just a couple of minutes. Stick around. Nevada Pure is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, and a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. DigiPath Labs. DigiPath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing DigiPath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the DigiPath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. And welcome back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. This is Mike McAuliffe with my co-host, Perry Haichu. Uh, we were just in the last segment talking about the uh, the U.S. government failing to reschedule marijuana and, uh, you know, a, a lot of political uh, uh, news to go with that. Uh, and, you know, the odd thing is that the DEA is saying that they don't want to reschedule marijuana because there's no medical benefit and they haven't proven any scientific studies. Yet, at, at the same time, and we get this... Uh, uh, this is from our reporter Jeremiah Jones, uh, and it says the U.S. government finally admits that marijuana really does kill cancer cells. And a little bit of history on this, uh, that back in 1973, the University of, of Virginia, uh, which is a very respected university in the country, did a study uh, for the National Institute of Drug Abuse uh, that found in, ra in lab mice that uh, cannabis compounds did kill uh, cancer cells, uh, specifically gliomas, brain cancer cells, and it took them and basically starved them of blood supply and uh, caused the cancer tumor to shrink and eventually disappear. And uh, because that was not in line with what the Nixon administration, which that same year was announcing the war on drugs, which was a war on hippies and Jews and Negroes and yeah. jazz people and various others, um, because that did not fit with their narrative. That report was buried, but ultimately the result, results were duplicated in 2000 at the University of Madrid in Spain on, on mice, and then uh, in 2009, in a very limited trial with only two people, they, were a, they found the exact same results. And so now the U.S. is coming around and say it does can kill cancer cells, and that's years after, 13 years after in 2003, the U.S. government pr uh, patented certain cannabinoids because they acted as neuroprotectants in the brain. So the, the government has known this has been going on all along. And so uh, apparently uh, the U.S. government has added a page on the use of can uh, cannabis and cannabinoids to their official cancer advice website. And uh, they advise that the National Cancer Institute, which is part of the U.S. Department of Health, now advises that cannabinoids may be useful 
in treating the side effects of cancer and cancer treatment by smoking, eating, baked products, drinking herbal teas, or even applying uh, sprays under the tongue sublingually. And so the, the government has a long list of medicinal uses of cannabis, including anti-inflammatory activity, pain relief, anti-anxiety, stress relief, anti-tumor, antiviral, relieving muscle spasm caused by mus multiple sclerosis, and many, many more. And so now the, the federal government is having this on their websites and is, is telling that, yes, this works. And yet, a different arm of the federal government is saying, oh no, there's no medical benefit. It just makes one's head want to explode. Who has the authority over who? That's the whole thing. Um, there is none really. It's just kind of well, it's just kind of laying there on the table for there people is to pick and choose whatever they the want. Depart the, the Department of Health uh, uh, is the U.S. Department of Health is who is saying that there there is use for this is an executive branch agency under the control of the president. And as I said in the last segment, the DEA under the, the Department of Justice is an executive branch agency under the control of the president. So um, much, as, much as I think he, he's done some good things in the country, uh, I, I've, I've thrown a lot of shade on the president for his cannabis policy. Mm -hmm. And this is an, an absolute example of that. It's just another reason why people think that we really need federal reform for these uh, for these laws and the state by state approach really mm -hmm. is not getting the job done fast enough and it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be working. There's a story out of uh, let me let me just we'll, we'll get to that in just one sec. Yeah, let sure. me just finish finish this off by sure. saying that you know we regularly. Um, beg you people who are listening to this to get out there and register and get out there and vote early voting absentee ballot whatever get make it easy on yourself get it done i've got something even easier that you can do grab a pen grab a paper i'll give you a couple of seconds to do that then i want to give you a phone number it's very simple area code 202 456 one four one four is the public line into the white house in washington dc I, I would ask any of you who are listening to this and who are interested in reform and are just outraged at the fact that that things aren't being done call up the white house complain it is it is your well, I don't know, God-given right, but constitutionally given right to let your leaders know how you feel. And this is a, a public line to the White House, and all these, these results are tallied. So, you know, if, if you don't want to go to weekend meetings, if you don't want to go out there and, and march, you don't want to go out there and do other things, just pick up the phone, and that number again is 202-456-1414. Call the president and give him a piece of your mind. Be respectful. Be, pol be polite, because you're just dealing with a White House operator there who's working a job like anybody else. But get your point across and let them know how you feel. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with having your voice heard. I think, I think I'm going to call them right after the show. <laughs> so I hope you do, too. So what do we have happening in New Mexico? Okay, well, there's a gentleman named Raimundo Marfuro of Deming, New Mexico. He's a patient in the medical marijuana program down there. Filed a lawsuit in the fall of 2015 alleging the Border Patrol was failing to adhere to a relatively new law that he claimed should allow him to travel through federal checkpoints without the risk of arrest or of his medical marijuana being confiscated. His only source of medical marijuana is in Las Cruces, about 60 to 65 miles from his house. To travel between the two cities, he must pass through a federal checkpoint. This is, of course, a problem. State card federal agency doing the checkpoint every single time there's there's trouble every single mm -hmm. time and he's been detained dozens of times uh, let's mm -hmm. see here district judge william johnson in an april ruling granted the border Pro border patrol's request for a dismissal agreeing that the gentleman's argument for the injunction didn't have legal grounds johnson specified his decision was without prejudice meaning the door was left open for the case to be refiled in another form mm -hmm. seizure not prosecution so basically they steal his weed every time they every time they find him and it's just like this guy's saying he's like these state-by-state -state laws do nothing to protect my rights he's jumped through all the hoops gone through all the process he's sacrificed all that he's had to sacrifice in order to get this medical marijuana card and now there's nothing more he can do he tried to even sue the government to force the issue they shut it down and he's just like what the hell am i supposed to do at this point so mm -hmm. you know he's basically the, you know, basically what the end of the article said he's thinking about moving to just avoid the damn and, and, trouble. and, and that's, that's essentially what he's going to have to do. I mean, um, countless Americans uh, over the past two centuries have uh, fought for, suffered, and died for our 
constitution really for our our rights the constitution that embodies who we are as a society as a people and you know in the bill of rights that fourth amendment that the people shall be secure in their homes and their persons from unreasonable and unwarranted searches or seizures that that is you know one of the central tenets of this society yet a few years ago the united states supreme court in, in a case that they heard decided that because of immigration issues and illegal immigration that anywhere a hundred miles or less from a border was essentially a constitution free zone that and that those the sea borders. rights yeah the, including the sea borders and and that therefore those anyone who's in that area does not have those protections that we were all granted under the bill of rights and if you take a look at the map and draw you know 100 100 miles within there you're talking about over half the people in the oh, country much more than half the people all of the population centers are on the coast los angeles san francisco houston miami t exactly you know, philadelphia uh, new york city boston i can go on and on and, and on. so an unelected supreme court which is a co-equal branch of government has decided that you know, oh, no more constitution for you. No, they call it the no constitution zone in some mm -hmm. of the more right wing uh, websites. Yeah, and it's a big map they have drawn out, but uh, it, it really is disappointing. And hopefully, we can get this guy some some. Job. He he's like he has to be a medical marijuana refugee within his own state. It's very uh, very. <laughs> and yeah, what he would and and I've been to Las Cruces and it's a lovely town uh, and it, it's down there close to the Mexican border. So if he did not uh, want to change his state of residency, but he wants to avoid this, yeah, he's going to need to to move a couple hours north. Yeah. And and he shouldn't have to do that. Once again, this guy is a is a state recognized and licensed patient, and the government has said we're not going after patients. We're not going after. We're not imprisoning patients. Yeah, we know that's not so. But the idea is they they say that they're not doing that, and yet how is seizing a patient's medicine and preventing him from getting relief, how can that be seen as anything it's other theft. than punitive action? It's just theft. And I, I thought that there was a clause in the Constitution or somewhere that said that we had the right to travel through the country unmolested. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't seem to be the case either. You know, they can stop you for damn near anything. Full in the faith idea. and credit. Yeah, we're, yeah. which is why, uh, as you were saying in the, in the first segment, that uh, that they're looking for a, a national uh, DUID law. Yeah. Uh, that's because some states uh, have it, some states don't. Nevada has this per se law, which is uh, arbitrary and. Oh, they're rallying uh, the troops. You know, like Mothers Against Drunk Driving and. And mm -hmm. all the the organizations that dedicate themselves to to putting the squeeze on those kind of things, which of course have noble causes, but they're really looking at this the wrong way. I heard a drunk driving, uh, mothers against drunk driving representative at at legislature trying to bash our our bill when we were trying to get the uh, the mm -hmm. nanogram r limits raised about how dangerous it was. It's like, lady, you have no idea what you're talking about. You know, my daughter got killed by a drunk driver. It's like that is not what we're here for. But people like look onto that and they're like, oh. You know, we feel so sorry for your loss and we can't let that happen. But it's like, what about the constant thousands and thousands of people who are being victimized on a daily basis? What about their rights? Mm -hmm. You know, what about their what about their civil rights? And I, I, I really thought for a long time that the cannabis industry or this cannabis movement, it's a civil rights issue. This is the next civil rights. Oh, issue. absolutely. And people kind of chuckle when I when I say that a little bit. But to the people fighting this war and living under that tyranny, it's not so funny to them no. when they're trying to be gainfully employed and not have their children taken away from them and, you know, live normal lives and or even just come out of the cannabis closet to their friends and their colleagues who they go to church or go to. You know, if their kids go to Sunday school with their parents, they can't talk about what they do recreationally because it might alienate them. It might get a call from CPS. Mm -hmm. They might call their job. Who knows what the hell may happen to them? Absolutely. You know, and it's just, it's, it, we are, cannabis are the most downtrodden, most looked upon, and most abused subsection of our society left. We're not allowed to go to work. We're not allowed to go on amusement park rides. We're not allowed to handle our kids. We're not allowed to say, what medicine we give our kids. We're not carry allowed firearms. to carry, carry firearms. We're not allowed to have commercial carry. driver's license. We're not allowed to do anything. We're yeah. not allowed to fly planes. We're not allowed to operate commercial fishing vehicles. We're not allowed to 
uh, uh, be involved in a lot of separate industries. And if you're a gaming operator, you're not allowed to be involved in the medical cannabis and, industry. And, you're, and I'm, sure, I'm certain that you're not talking about, you're not a proponent of people, you know, uh, having CDLs or, or, or carrying firearms while, while, they're, while they're stoned any oh more than, than if they were drunk. You see, and and yet the, people can carry firearms when they're drunk. Absolutely. It's the, the level, the legal limit for having a concealed weapon is, is 0 0.2 higher than the DUI law. It's mm -hmm. 0 0.10, not 0 0.08 to carry right. a concealed I went through the concealed weapons course before they yanked it from me for having a medical marijuana card and told me all about it. If you got to go to a bar, you can't, you got to be sure, you know, if you're going to go drink with your gun, you have to be sure that you don't get too drunk, too drunk. with your gun. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, okay. <laughs> so I was kind of trying to roll that around in my head. But still, uh, it, it, it's just very sickening almost. I, I do agree that it's a civil rights issue, and it, it's, it comes to the point of personal responsibility and sovereignty of oh, our own, over our own bodies. And that's I'm not where I was part going of the with that. That's where I was going with that, movement, right? is that people automatically think that we want to liken our movement to allowing people to get fucked up and do whatever they want. And that's not necessarily the case. I don't want people to be stoned out of their mind and go fly an airplane. Mm -hmm. That doesn't do anything for us. Mm -hmm. Trying to win hearts and minds, I guess, would be the official term or the army's term or whatever. But uh, it, it, we want to try to build bridges. We don't want employers to be fearful to have medical cannabis patients in their in their place of business. We just want people to be able to live their lives without repercussion for taking their damn medicine. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to break through. There was a guy on the Laughlin Buzz page, which is the Facebook page that has all the Laughlin... Uh, uh, residents that talk about what's going on and mm -hmm. they had a medical marijuana facility open down there a few months ago and this guy's like oh it smells like weed and this and that and I'm just like look first of all it's right next to the dump mm -hmm. and the dump stank there for like 15 20 years and no one really cared but the day this place opens the door you're gonna try to lay the hammer down on them because they're trying to conduct business and they've cleaned it up it did stink a little bit I went by and saw for myself but they like uh, the dump didn't yeah exactly though but you know they, they cleaned it up they got some new filters down and they're good to go and i told the guy and this guy's like i hate dopers and i hate this place and th how could this have happened in our peaceful community and i'm just like these are medical marijuana patients what the hell are you talking about and he's like if you sell drugs to my daughter i'm gonna put you in jail and i'm just like where did you where did you get that from Unless our conversation. your daughter has a medical marijuana Yeah, card. and I'm like, I don't understand where you got that. I'm like, no one is saying that they want to, like, peddle well, they're drugs. they're conflating medical marijuana with the legalization. Well, and up. even if it was recreational, which I support also, it doesn't matter because I saw an expose on ABC about they tried to have kids stand in front of a recreational pot store yes. and they were asking people to like go fishing basically like hey will you buy me a joint if i'll give you some cash it's just like not, they used to do with, one, or still do with six I've, packs outside of Seven Eleven. i did it a lot when i was a kid we were desperate when we were kids you know we did what we had to do uh usually it was a homeless guy but um not one person fell for fell for it mm -hmm. not well, they had dozens and dozens of people walk through and it really made the people who were doing the interview look like assholes because they were trying to paint the picture the other way i i would venture a guess though that um people who are consuming and, and purchasing cannabis at medical marijuana dispensaries are a little more cognizant of the the heavier penalties that they would get from distributing to a minor yeah, they're not than drug somebody dealers. who's just buy, buying them a, a beer or yeah, a bottle of Yeah, they're not dope-crazed uh, drug dealers. Train. They're normal people who just want to mm -hmm. relax and do their thing. And that's the whole thing is there's this conception among certain age groups or just among certain social groups. It does nothing to do with age. Uh, that has to say that, oh, well, if you smoke pot, you must be this this deviant, this pagan, or whatever the hell they think you are, mm -hmm. and you're going to sell dope to my kid, and you're going to you know, under, you know, know, under, do what you can to destroy the fabric of our society that people like my parents, a pastor and a cop, have built, and all this kind of crap. And mm -hmm. it's just like, I'm tired of that narrative. I'm really sick and tired of the narrative that you're a demon, or you're, you have the ability to be demonized just because of your cannabis use. It's just... It's just insane. I, w I was in junior high and high school in the, in the 70s. My dad was a Korean War vet, and he was very anti-drug. And he brought me up as very anti-drug. So through that time, through college, I never smoked pot. I never touched it, didn't want to hang out with anybody because I was, I don't want to say it, it, I was indoctrinated, but I was, I was brought up that this was not something 
to, to be using. You're and, taught to not like it. You're taught to hate it. Which is fine because the, the point I'm making is about this guy worried about his daughter. He is abdicating his parental responsibility to teach his daughter, his children, the difference between right and wrong in that has household. Right. And if, if you don't want your kids to be drinking or drugging or screwing around or anything, then it's up to you as a parent to instill them with a strong moral code yeah, that values. they can say no. In that yeah. time, when I was in high school, I had people offer me pot. I didn't want it. And, and so that was, that's the way to do it. And, you know, if, if parents are abdicating that responsibility and if parents are not uh, wanting to, uh, to teach their kids right, it, it blows my mind that most of those parents or many of those parents tend to be on the right wing of small government and personal responsibility and they're in horror at the idea of a nanny state and yet in this area, oh, come here nanny. Uh, I want you right next to me. Well, it's like I told you, they just pick and choose, you know. It's just one of those things. A lot of religious people I know do the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They'll uh they'll they'll slam their Bible down at you on one on, on one item and then on the other side I'm just like, you know, that's not very, you know, Christ like well, what just you're look doing at over there. Genesis yeah. 129. Let's let's you know, there are there are numerous points in the Bible that you can show are um I don't want to say pro cannabis, but are certainly not anti cannabis. And the people who uh who come up with that uh, they can't find a if, if you press them to it they can't find a mention of cannabis in the Bible it talks about it's it not talks really about wine no it's not really specifically mentioned right. there are interpretations that claim that certain like the anointing oil was made mm -hmm. with cannabis and things like that but there are so many different translations who's translating it where are the original texts but you there know, were no it, prohibitions was it, Hebrew, was it in it. Greek was it in Aramaic was it in this or that like who really Right. has the authority to say what that really said so I don't even really you know give that you know I don't really give too much to that I look more to like you know Genesis 112 like yeah. you said the more broad stroke well, idea of creation is holy and you know people make it evil I, I've read know. the book of Exodus and in the book of Exodus there are 74 different reasons uh, to kill somebody you know legitimate God-given reasons pot is nowhere to be found in those 74 reasons and that's a and that, that was a pretty exhaustive look. I don't know where Christians get the idea that marijuana is a bad thing, except for being told by the government, which supposedly, like you said, these right-wing people who more closely affiliate themselves with, with Christian dogma supposedly hate. Well, if God uh, created it, how can it be bad? It, you know. Well, you know, it's just like I've heard my mom in Alaska mm -hmm. smokes cannabis, mm -hmm. and she told me, you know, she's a devout, devout Christian, very strict evangelical you know all born again the whole works and she tells me about she's on these online forums talking to these these christians on these online forums about her cannabis use and they are just they just can't believe it you know that a, a christian would or someone would try to claim themselves as a christian if they smoked this horrible this horrible narcotic or whatever and it's just like the narrative is basically this simple if you smoke cannabis you're gonna go to hell and it's just like i don't understand how that that correlation is made in their head. Like, how do you come to that conclusion that because you smoke cannabis, Propaganda you're going to go to hell? It's just like there's nothing, there's nothing, you know, like, I guess I've heard it justified as, oh, you know, if you uh, disobey the law of the land or something that that's not holy or whatever, but if you work to change that said law of the land, you're also still an asshole. Mm, so I don't exactly Caesar know. And yeah, and render to God what is God's. To, uh, to no, uh, but still, uh, well, then pay your taxes. If we passed a law mm -hmm. that said if you pay cannabis tax, you're still an asshole. Like, I don't understand what to, what, 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 you know, you can't break through that wall sometimes. You know, it's it's un, it's very very frustrating. And we're not going to break something. through it now, but we do have to break through the wall to allow our sponsors a little chance course, to talk. And so we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Stick with us. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijin, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest 
lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. Getting Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting Legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999. That's 702-979-9999. Or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. And welcome back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour for our final segment today. So, you know, a lot of people are smoking pot. Whether they want to admit it or not, uh, a lot of people are doing it. And we see uh, CNN has come up with a, a recent uh, article. According to the poll released on August 8th, the percentage of American adults who say they smoke weed has nearly doubled in the past three years, according to Gallup. They're fairly reputable. I, yeah, they I, are. Yeah, trust them. According to those who participated in the survey, one in eight, or about 13%, reported current marijuana use, and 43% said they have tried the drug, an increase from 38% in 2013. The percentage of pot smokers was 7% in the 2013 Gallup survey. Now, when they say uh, they use marijuana, I believe they use that Within monthly. the last month. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the poll results were based on telephone interviews with about a thousand randomly chose, chosen adults, marijuana use in the United States of America. I think that that is a gross underrepresentation oh, just because yeah. of what people are willing to confess over the phone to the CN. You know, like I do this with you for a, for a living, for fun and all this. And people, uh, I, I, I would still kind of feel weirded out about telling someone over because the phone. Because it's not just time. It's, it's the U.S. government, uh, d- the um, uh, SAMHSA, which is the, uh, it's a mental health uh, y- federal uh, agency. Mm-hmm. And whether it was the U.S. government calling or Time Magazine or CNN or anybody I didn't know and starts asking me personal questions which have legal ramifications, <laughs> I don't know how willing I'd be to to share that with of course them. people have a lot to lose jobs children except like I was just discussing in the previous yes. segment how yes. risky this is so yeah for that many people to be so openly admitting to it just shows how uh, you know without any basis for for saying so uh, I've been guessing for years that, that the number of people who are actually current smokers are at least double those who would be willing to admit it to a stranger in a phone survey. I'd like to think so. It's like the silent majority kind of argument. Mm -hmm. When they were talking about Scotland was going to vote for independence, I forgot whether it was a year ago or two years ago or however long that was. Um, They swore up and down. All I saw on the TV was they're going to leave. It's going to happen. They're going to do it. You know, the polls are in our favor and we're going to, you know, we're done with the Brits. And then Mm -hmm. the polls came. And then when it actually came time to go down, a lot of people, the kind of the silent majority, those elderly people who really didn't want to leave, came out in force and kind of let their their voice be heard. And it was one of those things, you know, just because they were quiet about it doesn't mean that there's not a lot of people out there who really believe that that was the best course of action. But in the case of Scotland, they were also lied to by people in power, and they were told that um, something on the order of 137 million pounds per week, which were being paid to the EU, was going to instead stay in in Britain and be be put into their own health program and and uh, as somebody who's just come through major surgery if the if the government wants to pay for your health boy that sounds great to me and I would right. vote to stay in that too um, but within within a couple of days after the referendum uh, the leader of the of the uh, stay party admitted that that money was not going to be going to health that, that it was just he just kind of made it up and and Boris Johnson who'd been the former mayor of London uh, agreed that yeah you know we just kind of said that to, to get it passed and and Nigel Farage who was uh, leading that stay movement um, resigned as his post as, as the head of that um, organization within a couple of days because they had just they had friggin lied to the people oh that's you know par for the course it's okay for them to lie to us mm. but if we do it you know that's a, you know we will go to prison but it's, yes it's, it's okay it's okay for law enforcement the FBI local police or whatever to lie to us in in the course of their investigation absolutely legally it's, it's protected law, yet yeah. if we lie to them 
to save ourselves, to cover our assets, to cover a loved one, we can get charged. Well, they call it the noble lie. It's okay as long as it supposedly benefits the will of the people, or so they tell themselves, you know. And when mm -hmm. you lie to yourself so much, you start to believe it. That's when it gets dangerous. That, so yeah, yeah. It, it it does. So you know, for for these people uh, who are admitting. Uh, uh, I, I say, you know, kudos to you guys. It shows a, a lot of bravery. And um, uh, yeah. just recently, uh, Keith Stroop, who is the founder and, and head of Normal, uh, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, said uh, that this is the year. People need to come out of the closet in cannabis and people need to to s tell their friends their neighbors their relatives that yeah you know I smoke and the sky's not falling look I'm a responsible person this and that and that if we can do that and we humanize it's so easy to demonize them there's us the good salt of the earth Americans we'd never use that and it's them those druggies those mm -hmm. hippies those Mexican rapists that Donald Trump is talking about and everything so uh, I think that Keith is right in this, that uh, we're at a tipping point here and that we need to say, look, you know, it's us, you know, I, I've, uh, as Pogo said in the comic strip decades ago, I have seen the enemy and he is us. And, and it is the exact same thing. If we can just let enough people know that, um, you know, it's not strangers. It's not the the them that's doing it. Uh, maybe maybe we'll have some movement on this. You know, and we're we're getting movement in various cities in America. Yeah, this is an interesting article right here. It's by uh, Philip Smith from Alternet, released on August first, and the title of the article is "The Ten Stoniest Cities in America." Now, of course, a lot of these are very predictable. You know, which states mm -hmm. have the highest per capita cannabis use? But before we get into it, uh, before we get into that, there's a couple of regions that were mentioned, kind of as mm -hmm. honorable mentions that weren't specifically cities. Because they didn't have an urban center, but they still had that right. many people in a larger well, region. Alaska's northern coast was actually the highest polling place, second highest polling place in the country with, uh, what, what was it, damn near 15%, 14.93% of Alaska's north coast residents reported that they openly well, let, let, let me just ask, because you're, you're familiar with Alaska. You've spent some time up there. The northern coast, that to me sounds like above the Arctic Circle. I right? haven't that, been to the northern coast of Alaska, to tell you the well, truth. I mean, There's a lot of rural communities. Map, that, that seems to be the really, really cold spot. And I, I can't imagine much else that people can do up there. No, I, you know. no doubt. It's just... Uh, there's a lot of native villages up there mm -hmm. and things of that nature, and a lot of those villages are not only dry, but I would assume they would impose similar restrictions on their cannabis just I, because I think. Of, you know, there's a lot of crime although, associated with that. Although Alaska decriminalized cannabis back in 1975, and yeah. then they, they kind of pulled back from that a little bit in the 90s. Yeah, well, number eight on the list out of the mm -hmm. top ten is uh, Anchorage. 12.37% of Anchorage uh, residents reported that they smoke cannabis. And the Alaska Supreme Court legalized pot possession in 79. Prohibitions mm -hmm. managed to undo that a few years later. But now the wheel has turned again with the state ending marijuana prohibition in 2014. And Alaskans mm -hmm. are taking full advantage. They smoke even more dope on the North Slope with 14.99%. Mm -hmm. But there's no cities worth mentioning up there. Now, of course, like I said, there are native villages up there and a lot of oil jobs. Mm -hmm. All those jobs, and strangely, this is another issue that we kind of roll into. It's the jobs issue I was talking about. All these people who work on these oil rigs, I get calls from my friends who do uh, rescue, mm -hmm. rope, rigging rescue, and just standard uh, rigging work, and they want to know, how do I pass my drug test? Because, you know... They're the best climbers in the world. They want to go save people's lives. But hey, if you smoke pot off break, you're not qualified to work here, even though we flew yeah. you up here at our expense and pay you $100 an hour to do this. Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, you're not good enough if you smoke, if you smoke cannabis. So uh, but here, we're, have, we're desperately but, trying. But have this beer with me. As much as Sit you want, and, for sure. You know, as much as you ball. want. And we're, they're desperate to get, that, to get that dealt with. So for those people who have so much to lose up there to be admitting that, like you said, must yep. be must be something to it. So but we'll run through it real quick. Spoil, yeah, spoiler alert: Las Vegas is not one of the no. ten stoniest cities. But let's see, since most Las Vegans come from somewhere else, let's see if one of uh, if your home is on the list. I mean, San Francisco, at number one, fifteen and a half percent. What a surprise! Yeah, no half Hit a Ashbury, ago, go. Yeah, half a century ago it was the hot spot. It still is. Mm -hmm. Denver, surprise again, number two, fourteen point nine percent. The Recently, mile high. They don't call it the mile high city for yeah. nothing. Number three, Seattle. Again, <laughs> a, a legalization state, <laughs> right? And and in none of these states has, has the sky fallen. No, well, Burlington, Vermont is number four. That's kind of been a a northeastern 
Well, that's Bernie Sanders territory. Yeah, that's pretty sure. Yeah. But uh, people think it's more conservative just because it's a little bit more rural, but they like their weed up there, too. Uh, is, isn't Vermont, is that uh, live free and die, or is that's that... New Hampshire, uh, I thought. That's New Hampshire, yeah. But then, you know, Portland, Portland, Portland Oregon, Oregon to be expected. Boston surprised me, mm -hmm. for sure. I didn't see that one. Uh, Providence, Rhode Island, I knew that they had a medical marijuana program there. Didn't realize it was so popular. Anchorage, no surprise there. Olympia, Washington, another recreational state. And Albuquerque, New Mexico, they have medical there, but once again, I don't think they're recreational. And, and you just mentioned uh, New Mexico in, in this story about the guy who keeps getting, uh, who keeps getting searched, yep. so... Okay. You know, but, it's but, we're, but, uh, we're running but out of time. yes, we are, and and it's amazing how quickly the time goes. But thank you for spending a little time with us. Uh, we strive to bring you current news stories and and keep you on the cutting edge of what's going on. So please uh, join us again next week, and we will bring you more I won't, Nevada I won't have an news. opportunity to be here for the next two weeks. But you'll you're have doing field co reporting. Yes, sir. I'll do be doing some field reporting, but I'll see you when I get back. And thank you all again. All right, we'll see you then. Bye now.